This research methods in psychology video covers ethics. Researchers in psychology have a responsibility to look after their participants. So what are the participants' rights? Who decided them? And what exactly do you do as a researcher if your research needs to break an ethical guideline? Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. It's fair to say that some psychological studies have a bit of a reputation for mistreating participants. In fact, they're some of the most well-known studies. They also tend to be older studies. These days, psychologists are more likely to follow a set of guidelines. In America, the American Psychological Association writes the ethical guidelines, and in the UK, it's the British Psychological Society, known as the BPS. In this video, I'll focus on the BPS's guidelines. If you want to read the latest version of the BPS's guidelines, you can find them here. It's actually only a few pages long and it's pretty easy to read. But it's important to keep in mind these ethical guidelines are just advice. Psychologists can and do bend and even break these rules. But serious mistreatment of participants would likely result in being expelled as a member of the BPS. Ethical issues. Informed consent. Participants should be made aware of the aims, purpose and consequences of taking part in research and provide their informed consent before the study begins. If participants are not able to give consent, such as children or mentally incapable, consent can be given by a parent or guardian. Right to withdraw. Before taking part in the research, participants should be told they have the ability to end their participation in the study at any stage. And this includes destroying any personal data collected on them, like interview recordings. Protection from harm. The researcher needs to consider the study from the perspective of the participant, and consider any risk to the participant's psychological well-being, physical health, personal values and dignity. Confidentiality. Personal records should be kept securely, and when it comes to publishing results, not give away personally identifiable information. But in some situations, confidentiality needs to be broken, so if the researcher feels a participant or somebody else is in danger. Debriefing. After the participant has completed their role in the study, the researcher should give them a debriefing. This is a conversation that tells the participants the reasons for the research, any outcomes and the existence of other groups. This is also the point to check for any harm caused by taking part and offer assistance. Ethical issues. Psychologists can be torn between the participants' ethical rights and wanting to gain valid data free from demand characteristics, or maybe investigating interesting but controversial, even harmful topics. Consider Milgram. Yeah, the researcher who used an authority figure to pressure participants into giving what they thought were real electric shocks to learners. From the perspective of the guidelines above, he breached pretty much everyone. Informed consent, no. The participants were deceived. Right to withdraw, no. The participants were pressured to continue for as long as possible. Protection from harm, no. There's pretty good reason to think many participants suffered during and after the experiment. Confidentiality, no. The participants were recorded and the recordings were released. Some people even criticised Milgram for his debriefing, participants leaving not fully understanding the purpose of the study and having concerns about their ability to harm others. Dealing with ethical issues. So there are ethical considerations, but also researchers need to produce valid data. By now you're aware of demand characteristics. The participant altering their behaviour because they're aware of the research aim, usually shaping their behaviour in the belief it'll help out the researcher. There aren't free alternatives to informed consent that avoid giving away the aim, and they are. Prior general consent. This is having a long list of things that could happen in an experiment and getting a participant to agree to all of it and not be told which parts will actually be included in the study. Retroactive consent. This is where you'd get consent for the participant's data to be used, but only after they've taken part in the research. Presumptive consent. You ask a group similar to the participants if they would agree to take part in a study, and if they agree, you assume the experimental group would consent. Now, none of these ways of getting consent are perfect, but they are ways of avoiding participants changing their behaviour due to demand characteristics. There may be times that a research design requires deception, or maybe even risking harming participants. In this case, a cost-benefit analysis can be conducted. This is considering and comparing all potential costs to the participants with the potential benefits to wider society of the research. Considering Milgram again, a number of participants did suffer emotional harm from taking part in the experiment. But Milgram has been one of the most famous and influential studies ever conducted, taught to millions of students and helps all of us think more deeply about what our limits would be if we were asked to do something wrong by an authority figure. 
From a cost-benefit analysis perspective, you may judge Milgram was worth the cost. An ethics committee is a group of people who consider if research should be carried out based on ethical principles, and they may use a cost-benefit analysis in their decision-making process. If you go to university to do a psychology degree, the decision on if you can collect your data for your final project will be decided by the university's ethics committee. The debriefing can also be a time to deal with any ethical issues, such as revealing to the participants if they've been deceived, revealing the existence of any other groups, reminding them they still have the right to withdraw their data, checking for harm and offering support if they have been harmed. This happens at the end of a study and sometimes in the exam you can be asked to design a debriefing form or an informed consent form. So that was ethics. I have six tutorial videos covering the 2017, 18 and 19 AS and A-level research method sections. These videos have worked examples to every question and are full of exam tips. Patrons at the neuron level and above can access these, as well as many, many more hours of exam tutorial videos, as well as over 100 printable resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. I do want to thank all the students and teachers who have supported Psychboost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Methods Unit. It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. I also want to give a special shout out to the patrons who support me at the developer level. So thanks to them and I'll see you in the next Research Methods video, peer review.